Thank you, Brian, and welcome to Hubert's again for the evening class. We've been talking about <clears throat> the five solas uh, of the Protestant Reformation. Sola Scriptura, the word of God alone in the sacred scripture. Sola Fide, faith alone. Sola Christo, only Christ saves. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is both Catholic and Protestant teaching. And the uh, sola uh, Deo Gloria, glory to God alone. We don't need intercessory saints or angels or anything like that. Uh, all glory and honor belongs to God. Sola gratia or grace alone. Um, again, uh, they would say the following, the language of grace so permeates the Bible and in all traditions of Christian theology that to claim that salvation is by grace alone is in itself to claim very little at all. <clears throat> it does not distinguish Augustine from Pelagius, Thomas Aquinas from Gabriel Briel, Martin Luther from uh, Erasmus or William Perkins from James Arminius. What distinguishes them then is now how grace is understood. And I need to emphasize that, I'll tell you. There is therefore a need for a definition. Let's grace become merely an empty piece of theological rhetoric. Indeed, unlike faith alone, grace alone as a simple phrase is unlikely to provoke much controversy among anyone who claims to be Christian. The key verses as the, uh, the uh, Calvinist theologian would say, would be like Ephesians chapter two, verses one through 10. <clears throat> For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your doing, it is the gift from God, not a result of works, so that no one could ever boast before God. Now works here, is works of the law, not works of grace done by charity. So you have to make that distinction. And then uh, Paul's letter to Titus, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age waiting for the blessed hope and the appearing of our great glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's a great line. That's Paul's letter to Titus, uh, chapter 2, 11, 13. Again, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation. Well, who's the grace of Christ? Christ is the grace of Christ. Christ is the grace of God. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, John's gospel. So again, you know, uh, this leads to sola Christus and uh, glory to God alone. Now, uh, however, how you define grace is very different. And, uh, and grace is always linked with the notion of justification. To quote from the catechism, grace, our justification comes from the grace of God. Grace is favor, the free and undeserved help that God gives to us to respond to his call to become children of God, adoptive sons and daughters, partakers of the divine nature and of eternal life. Grace is a participation in the life of God. It introduces us to the intimacy of the life of the Trinity by baptism, and Christian participates in the grace of Christ, the head of the body, the church. As a adopted son or daughter, he can henceforth be called, you know, as an adopted son or daughter, he can call God his father. There is a relationship, for there is a union with his son, Jesus Christ. This vocation to eternal life is supernatural. Grace is a vocation into supernatural life. It depends entirely on God's gratuitous initiative for he alone can reveal and give himself. It surpasses the power of human intellect and will as that of every 
other creature. The grace of Christ, as the catechism continues, is the gratuitous gift that God makes to us of his own accord, infused by the Holy Spirit into our souls to heal it of sin and to sanctify it. It is the sanctifying or deifying grace received in baptism. It is that source of the work of sanctification. So, sanctifying grace is an habitual grace. It's always there with you. Okay. A stable and supernatural disposition that perfects the soul. Notice, perfecting the soul and itself to enable to live with God as an act of love. By habitual grace, the church means the following. It means the permanent disposition to live and act in keeping with God's call is distinguished from actual graces, which refer to God's intervention, whether at the beginning of our conversion or in the course of the work of sanctification. So grace and justification or sanctification are always linked. But I think it's always good to remember that when you talk about justification and grace, it depends on how you view faith. And we've been talking about that for quite a bit. So my last point here from the catechism, it deals with faith and freedom. This is where Protestant Catholics would in fact disagree. To be human, man's response to God by faith must be free. And therefore nobody is to be forced to embrace the faith against his or her will. The act of faith is by its very nature a free act. God calls all people to serve him in spirit and in truth. Consequently, they are bound to him in conscience, not by coercion. The binding of God by faith to the individual can never be coerced. This fact receives its fuller manifestation in Christ Jesus. Indeed, Christ invited people of faith and conversion, but never coerced them. For he bore the witness to the truth, but refused to use force to impose it on those who spoke against it. His kingdom grows by the love with Christ alone, lifted high upon the cross and draws everyone to himself. So again, this is a very important issue. It is free, it is a free gift. So this is why there is a difference between how we view faith, faith and reason, and the Protestant view, uh, faith uh, being a pure gift by the Holy Spirit through grace, but uh, grace doesn't perfect human nature. So grace and faith justify, because you can't separate grace, faith, and justification. Justification is your right relationship with God, which he initiates in you by way of grace, by the gift and power of the Holy Spirit. So faith and grace and justification are always linked together. And within our Roman Catholic tradition, it is a free gift. You can accept it or reject it. In classical reformational thought, uh, it is just simply there. And there is no freedom. Uh, God elects, God chooses, and God disposes you to that grace. So in the catechism, when we talk about justification, we read as follows. The grace of the Holy Spirit has the power to justify us. Name, that is, to cleanse us from sin and to communicate to us righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, through baptism. Righteousness means that we stand in a correct posture with God. We read in Romans chapter 6, verse 8 to 11. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. For we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all, 
but the life he leads, he leads to God. So you must also consider yourself dead to sin, but alive in God, in Christ Jesus. So for us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we take part in Christ's passion by dying to sin and his resurrection by being born to new life. And we are members of his body, the church, branches grafted into the vine himself. And he is the vine and we are the branches. So we read, God gave himself to us through the spirit. By participation of the spirit, we become communicants in the divine nature. For this reason, those in whom the spirit dwells are divinized. So very important line there. So when you are baptized, the Holy Spirit comes upon you and your body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you're not your own, you belong to God. You may not do to your body whatever you so desire. Your life, your body, your existence belongs to God. It is a gift. So the first work of grace of the Holy Spirit is conversion, affecting justification in accordance with Jesus' proclamation of the beginning of the gospel. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Moved by grace, human beings turn toward God and away from sin, thus accepting forgiveness and righteousness from on high. Justification is not only the remission of sins, but also the sanctification and renewal of the interior person. Justification is at the exact same time the acceptance of God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. Righteousness simply means justice. Here it means it is the rectitude of divine love. With justification, faith, hope, and charity are poured into our hearts and obedience to the divine will is granted to us. So for us, justification is the most excellent work of God. Now, the problem is going to be when we stand before God, after reading the citations from the Catechism and from the uh, Protestant documentation, we believe that we are in right accord to the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is righteousness. Justification. Again, justice is giving someone that's owed to them because they have signed a contract. Justification begins with Genesis chapter 17 with Adam, with uh, Abraham being called by God. This is prior to the Torah. So works of the Torah did not exist. And Paul wants to say, how was Abraham justified before God and made righteous? Well, he was made justified or justice giving God that was due to him by faith, by way of grace. So the covenant is, I am God, you are my people, you will own the land, and you'll have many descendants. If you're faithful to me, if that's the virtue of justice, give me that which is due to me by contract. And we have agreed that circumcision is the sign of the covenantal contract. If you hold that, then... I will be faithful to you and you will be faithful to me. You will own the land and you'll have, and you'll have prosperity and posterity simultaneously. But there is no other God. You will not bend the knee to anything else or anyone else. Allegiance to God is absolute by way of faith. And when you have that disposition of faith, namely putting your confidential trust in the authority of God, in the person of Jesus Christ, by the activity of the Holy Spirit given to you by grace, which is your participation in Christ's passion, death, and resurrection, that's how you're saved. So justification means you have given God what you agreed upon, that you will be faithful to his covenant, and that has made you righteous. You stand in a, a correct or right position before your God. 
And that's done by faith. Now, the question is going to be, how do works come into this? Not works of the law. Works of the law simply do not say. So when Protestants quote uh, Galatians and, and Romans and say, well, see, works do not say. Paul is talking about works of Torah, the 613 mitzvot. He's not talking about works of charity done by grace and the activity of the Holy Spirit. For you to choose an for you to choose a good and to do good and to be good, that is the activity of the Holy Spirit by giving you the grace, which is your participation in the life of God, that leads to Christian perfection. But again, going back, and I know I'm being redundant here, when you say that grace cannot perfect human nature, because human nature is utterly defiled in total degradation, then grace does not perfect, it simply imposes itself. Grace, from a Protestant view, by its very nature, is irresistible. Once God sends you the grace, you cannot resist it. Because <clears throat> you've been pre-elected. You've been pre-elected. So grace cannot be refused. Therefore, grace doesn't need to perfect. We, in the Roman Catholic tradition, have a different perspective. No, we are not completely defiled or total, uh, totally uh, depraved. We are weakened by the sin of Adam, as I said time and time again. And grace, as a gift, is pure gift, is pure, tender loving mercy, has said, grace is God's tender loving mercy, given spontaneously, lovingly, to his creation. And you don't merit the first grace. So what we, what we call in Roman Catholic tradition, uh, prevenient grace, it is, it is the first grace of grace. It is the first of all graces. It is that impulse by the Holy Spirit that gives you the ability to choose. It's not imposed. Protestant uh, thought would say, it, it, God simply freely gives it to whomever he wishes and it's irresistible. <clears throat> Because your election is, is, is unconditional. You do nothing to be elected. God's already pre-elected you from the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2. We hold a different perspective. Because of our weakened state, however, the activities of the human being, reason and will, are active to know God on a natural level. And then when you cooperate with grace, it is sanctified. That's why in baptism, it's not just a mere covering up of the sin of Adam. From a Roman Catholic tradition, Protestant tradition is that you simply are declared saved. You're washed in the blood of Christ. And that's what makes God pleasing. He doesn't see you as intrinsically evil. What he sees is you dripping with with the very blood of his son. But the blood of your son does not intrinsically change your nature. You're still a sinner. So you are declared free from the imputation of Adam's sin. That's not Catholic doctrine. Catholic doctrine says you are made a new creation. The old Adam has been destroyed. You've got into the water. You die with Christ. You rise with Christ. You participate now through Christ's passion, death, and resurrection by grace, and that grace justifies you. And it gives you the ability to believe, to have faith. To the point that you become temples of the Holy Spirit. So by analogy, you are divinized. The God that creation cannot hold, your body becomes its temple. That is an incredible teaching. The Greek Orthodox or Eastern form of Christianity has always emphasized the demonization of grace-filled human nature. Yes, we have fallen, but now through, through Christ's passion, death, and resurrection, grace has been, been bestowed upon you. You are temples of the Holy Spirit, so divine life has lifted a fallen human nature. There is no lifting to divine life in classical 
reformational thought. You are simply covered over by the blood of Christ, and that's what God sees. Catholic point of view, the blood of Christ doesn't simply cover it in a profound, intrinsic way makes you a new creation. You have a new existence when you're baptized with water and then receive faith. Faith, uh, again, sacraments can only, be seen, can only be understood and seen as signs of faith. They are, are not magical symbols. They're not some magical ritual uh, sacraments and the reception thereof of each and every sacrament presumes the disposition of faith. So you don't go to a sacrament thinking, oh, this is some sort of a ritualistic ritual which I will partake in, and then something automatically happens. Uh, for something to automatically happen, you have to have the faith disposition. Sacraments confer grace in and of themselves by the activity of, not of the church, it's the activity of Christ through the church. Sacraments are acts of Christ through his church, through the humanity of another individual. So the divine activity of Christ is present in another human being. Sacraments are acts of Christ through his church, but they are acts of Christ, not acts of the one celebrating the sacrament, because that person who celebrates whatever sacrament has to have the disposition of Christ. And that disposition ultimately is faith by grace, by the gift and power of the Holy Spirit. So for us Roman Catholics, that is a major issue. You know, so it's not grace and works of the Torah. No, it's grace and works of love through the activity of God. It's not faith alone, it's faith and works for, with us. It's faith and works. Now, the question is going to be, do the works done by grace and faith by the gift and power of the Holy Spirit, does that bring about salvation? From a Roman Catholic point of view, absolutely. From a Protestant view, it does not. Faith alone saves. Roman Catholic view, faith with works saves. And are works necessary for salvation? Not works under Torah, not the 613 mitzvot, but works of charity done in faith with the faith disposition, with the activity and promise and the assistance of the Holy Spirit by way of grace. I know I'm being redundant here, but you got to get it right. Okay. And, and so this is a major difference. Again, this gets into what we understand justification to be what brings about our right relationship with God. And is that grace, as I said yesterday, is it offered to everyone or is it only offered to God's elect? And this gets into, you know, uh, uh, the limitation of divine activity, uh, limited atonement. Did Christ only die for the elect? Or did he die for everyone? Well, that's the problem. Limited atonement. Because there's unconditional election on God's part. So is he saying, is he saving all humanity? Or is he simply saying, uh, saving the elect that he has chosen to save? That's a big difference. And in order to be saved and justified <clears throat> by grace, you have to make some profession of faith in Christ Jesus. If there's no profession of faith in Christ Jesus, there's no salvation. So in some fundamentalist uh, circles in the realm of reformational theology, unless you profess that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will not be saved. Grace is not given. You're, you're only saved when you affirm the activity of grace through the Holy Spirit in your life 
by making a proclamation of faith. If there's no proclamation of faith, you cannot be saved. And that's a very fundamentalist view. Again, there are different views of justification within uh, Protestant or Reformational theology and post-Reformational theology. There are different views. So, there, so it's not all one thing. There's a lot of theological nuancing here. So for, so for some Christians, unless you profess who Jesus is, son of the living God, coming from the God that brings salvation to all, all that has been pre-elected in the mind and will of God, unless you do that, you will not be saved. We Roman Catholics do not hold that. We hold God gives, gives sufficient grace, therefore sufficient justification to all people. For us, God would never create any individual without giving that individual the ability to acknowledge and to come and to serve him. And so even without direct public divine revelation, can a non-Christian come to God by way of grace, which he alone knows, which only God alone knows. And there's, there's that mystery of justification. Uh, God being God. Let's say you have people that have no capability to know about Jesus Christ or the presence of God or the person of God. Are they totally bereft without God? They, 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 they are already preconditioned to be exiled forever from God from all, uh, for, for all eternity because they have never known God, nor was the notion of God ever broached to them. Is it fair of God to say, you can never be a part of me, even though you've never heard of me. And so I now pre-elect you to reprobation rather than salvation. Is that God? So in Roman Catholic thinking, uh, no, God gives sufficient grace for everyone for salvation without exception. Now, what you do with that grace, that is your business. Classical reformational thought would say, all, all that doesn't mean anything. You, uh, election is unconditional. Uh, atonement is limited and grace is irresistible, period. You have nothing to do with it. Whatever, however and whatever God elects, that's what he does. So there's no freedom. No, it's simply preordained. In the Roman Catholic tradition, we simply do not accept that. So, as I said yesterday, can a person who practices animism, which is some sort of ambiguous, uh, powerful source that pervades all of creation, pervades the universe that might be attached to this tree or this mountain or this type of uh, uh, physicality found in creation. There's some sort of supernatural presence or transcendence or supernatural power, which may be good or not so good, but it pervades creation. And there's no personal deity whatsoever. There's no personalization of this animistic reality. Can God still function and send the spirit through grace to that type of a system. From a Roman Catholic point of view, of course. Other, view, other Protestant churches would say no, no. Uh, human nature of itself, because of its total depravity, cannot entertain a natural notion of God, no matter how hard you try. You simply don't have the faculty or the power to do that. We in the Roman Catholic tradition hold the exact opposite. And as St. Paul talks about in chapter, uh, chapter two of, of Romans, what the Jew has by way of revelation and Torah, the Gentile, the non-believer has by way of nature and grace, nature, conscience, and grace. As I said before, let God be God. So God 
can do whatever he so desires. It's his understanding of why he created us the way that he did. It's his understanding. And, he, and if there are people that have never heard of his existence or have never heard of Jesus Christ, are they blameful for not knowing? Yeah. So again, this raises that whole justification issue. Uh, can, can you be justified by grace without knowing Jesus Christ? That's a very interesting question. Paul makes it very clear, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Where sin is, namely the negativity, the absence of God, can grace still be, be present? Where sin is, grace abounds even more. That would drive some reformers up the wall. No. You can do nothing naturally good or naturally grace-filled without grace itself. We hold let God be God. Can his grace permeate obstinacy? Can his grace permeate ignorance? Can his grace permeate a mind that's totally blocked from knowing God? Well, grace is powerful. Grace is efficacious. Can the conscience, can the human conscience if it's open, can it respond to the activity of God? See, that's the issue. Can human nature and the ability to have a conscience, which is to make a moral judgment, by the way, conscience deals with making pragmatic moral judgments. When one is searching for the truth, trying to search for the good, can he or she attain the good, the true, with some form of moral certitude. We hold yes, Protestants would hold no. And we hold that can God speak to the individual in any contextual framework in which the human person exists? We would hold yes. He can speak to, to whomever he wishes and however he wishes. So in some Christian circles, I know I'm being redundant here, they would say, no, total depravity, God has already pre-elected you, there's nothing you can do. And he will manifest himself to you. And there's that time in which grace is in fact given, and it's bestowed, it isn't earned, you don't have freedom to resist it, it is irresistible. And you are guaranteed of perseverance into heavenly life by way of grace. That's how you're justified. We Catholics hold a very different view. So uh, you, you really have to keep that in mind when you talk about you know, justification. Uh, how are we in right stead with God? That's why I love the, uh, the story in Luke's gospel of Zacchaeus, who is a uh, tax collector. Uh, that means a collaborator with the Roman Imperium and the Jews hated the Roman Imperium, you know, with a passion. They hated their Eretz Israel, the land of Israel to be occupied by Gentiles who believed that the emperor was somehow divine and there were multitudinous gods, not the one God of Israel, now many gods. So here's Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector, collaborating with the Roman Imperium, despised by other Jews, and he was a rich tax collector. And he was a chief tax collector. And he wants to see Jesus. He climbs up the sycamore tree, hoping to see him. Jesus passes down. He looks up. Jesus looks up and sees. Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to stay at your house tonight. And the crowd, the people that see, he's gone to the house of a sinner. 
how can he eat with a sinner? And that's, and that's classical Judaism. You don't eat with those people that would defile you by not obedience, by not obedience to the Torah. <clears throat> you stay away from those people. Why would you have a friendship or a meal with a person that is disobedient to the mitzvahs contained within Torah? You'll stay away from those people. And, and in the Hebrew mind, when Israel fell from grace because of disobedience and started to follow other God, that was because of their relationship with these Gentile polytheists and we wanted the cultural materiality of the Gentiles because it seemed to, to be good. So we renounced our faith, lived like Gentiles, and God sent prophet after prophet saying, come back to me, be true to the Torah, be true to the covenant, and you refuse, okay? Your constant refusal has an effect, namely exile. And you allowed non-Jews or Jews that no longer profess identity with the God of Israel to rule you. So you lost your land, you lost the temple and you lost your own people and you lost your own monarchy. And in later time, it was given back to you, but the exile was due to the fact of disobedience, following another God, following another non-faith-filled tradition, a Gentile tradition. And so that's why they started to murmur against Jesus and Zacchaeus. He's going to eat with a sinner. He's collaborating with a Gentile, for heaven's sakes. Jesus, what are you doing? How can grace be in this man's life? He's working for Gentiles. He's a tax collector. He's a sinner. And now Jesus is going to eat with this person? What does Zacchaeus say? Zacchaeus stood his ground and said, wait a minute here. Don't believe that. Lord, I give half of my belongings to the poor. Half, they don't know that, but I'm telling you what I do. And if I have discharged anyone unfairly, I pay it back fourfold. Torah says when you do something that's, uh, that's economically unjust, you are to pay it back double. Well, under Roman law, you pay it back fourfold. Well, I'm acting like a Jew, but under Roman law, if I have done something wrong, or if I cheated anyone at any time, I pay it back fourfold. What does Jesus say? Today, salvation has come to this man's house. And that's a play on words, by the way. Yeshua, Jesus, Yeshua means Yahweh saves. Jesus is the salvific activity of God in human flesh. So when he came to dine with Zacchaeus, and of course, Zacchaeus is delighted that this itinerant rabbi from Galilee has come down and is now having dinner in his house. And he says, this man here whom you condemn as being unfit for God, Torah, grace, and the activity of God, Jesus calls him a son of Abraham, a son of faith. Interesting. He calls him a son of Abraham. Abraham's the father of faith. But to his contemporaries, Zacchaeus was a sinner. Cooperating with Gentiles. Over taxation. And they were wrong about him. And yet Jesus saves him. And Jesus says, I've come to seek out the lost. Well, who's lost here? Is it, is it Zacchaeus? No. He believes in the God of Israel. And those who also believe in the God of Israel don't like him because he is working for Gentiles, non-believers, the uncircumcised. How can God work through him? How can God's grace work through this individual who's collaborating with our enemy? That's the problem. That's my whole point. Let God be God. 
Notice he didn't eat at someone else's house. Why did, see, you have to ask the question. Jesus, what was on your mind when you asked Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector that people despised, why did you choose him to eat at his house and call him a son of Abraham? A person of faith. How can he be a person of faith? When he's acting like a Gentile and taxing us to give money to these uncircumcised, non-believing Gentiles. How can he be of God? How can he be of God? He can't be of God. Yet Luke has Jesus calling him a man of faith. Interesting. Very interesting. The wrapping of the package is all wrong, but inside the package is good. Very interesting thing to think about. That's why I love that Zacchaeus narrative only found in Luke. Why would Jesus eat with a sinner or a supposed sinner and call him a son of Abraham, namely a son of faith, because Abraham's a father of faith, and then say, Salvation has come to this house this day because I have walked into your house, Zacchaeus, and I'm here to save. What does that tell you about God? And that's my whole point. Let God be God. He can go wherever he wishes to go. Let, it, let God be God. Well, he doesn't fulfill what we think scripture says. Well, who's the author of scripture? Isn't it God through the human agency of other human beings? Let God be God. Okay, it's time for now Q&A. Brian, anyone out there? Uh, yes, so if anyone has a question, uh, just please use the raise hand function. Uh, I'll wait a bit. Yes, uh, Chuck and Mary Beth Clark, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Just uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. So what is the question? Uh, I'm still waiting for them to unmute Father one moment, please. Okay. Uh, Chuck and Mary Beth Clark, just please uh, unmute your microphone so we can hear your question. I guess they're having a uh, problem with like, that. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, again, uh, I'll be back tomorrow morning and tomorrow evening. And so they can ask that question then. So as in closing, again, it's the issue of justification, grace, and faith. It's all linked together. And so tomorrow, I'm going to talk about the uh, Lutheran and Catholic uh, dialogue and declaration on justification and grace. Is there some uh, reconciliation between the Catholic and Protestant view? So stay tuned. We'll see you tomorrow morning and evening. God bless. Take care. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thank you.